Ciao, and welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast, a dialogue about how space technology and exploration are transforming our solar system. Welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much, Cole. Thanks for having me. We're honored to have you here, and uh, where are you calling in from? Uh, we're based out of New Hampshire, so uh, I like to say it's the uh, center of all things space. The rest of the world just hasn't caught up to us just yet. So um, it's uh, kind of a cloudy day today here in uh, New Hampshire, but uh, it was quite beautiful yesterday. But We're in peak season for all the leaves up here, so a lot of tourists. Nice. Same here. We'll have to make it up there sometime. So. Please do. So we were wondering what were kind of the your your moments and story when you decided, you know, we're we're starting this company and committing over the years to to rogue space systems. Sure. So it really started off as a research paper uh, back in school, and uh, the, the figure that kind of stood out for for me was that there was. The U.S. government tracked approximately 300,000 debris strikes um, in space, and I was like, you know, that's a problem that really should get solved, and I thought about it for several months, took a couple of classes, and after some encouragement for, from some of, the, uh, some of my professors, um, I decided to go to the MIT Space Conference, and I spoke to a lot of uh, potential investors and a lot of uh, people from the industry and really learned that uh, it's about building a team and uh, really understanding the problem uh, that you're trying to solve and uh, <clears throat> that kind of the uh, best idea at the moment was to try and build robots to do cool things in space. So after that, I called up my partner at the time and told him, hey, we're going to move into a whole new thing. We're going to go to space. And here we go. It's uh, two and a half years later, and um, things are almost three years later, and things are going pretty well for us. Nice. Seems like it. And I think you guys are really kind of – I we see you guys as – the leader in this uh, de debris mitigation field to some extent. I wouldn't say that necessarily we're the leader uh, in debris. Uh, there's a couple of other companies that are really pushing that. Rogue is really focused on in-space servicing, which includes debris. Uh, we like to believe we are thought leaders. Um, we have some pretty advanced technology. We have some pretty advanced thinking, forward thinking. Uh, surrounding those topics and areas. Uh, but I would say we are a leader, maybe not the, but certainly a, once uh, we get into space next year. Um, then, yeah, maybe we can talk about uh, leading the industry. Nice. Yeah, the, um was reading up on some of the, the your your Orbot vehicles, one of the, the, the three or bot on orbit servicing mm -hmm. spacecraft yeah. looks very exciting. Yes. So uh, our our three spacecraft that we're really working on uh, primarily we're focused on Lara and um, uh, eventually Fred. Lara is an inspection and observation spacecraft. Uh, she's going up next year, um, and we're hoping to have Fred, uh, which has got the robotics. That'll probably go up uh, the next year. It kind of depends on how things flow, but we're moving very quickly, and our partnership with SAIC is really going to help us accelerate a lot of these development programs. Nice. With Laura, I um, was reading you guys, you're going to have a 19 kilogram um, wet mass spacecraft with a one millimeter resolution radar and hyperspectral imaging. Yes, it's um, the the instrument, the sensor set is going to probably change up just a little bit. Um, 
mostly because of uh, some of the swap that we've had to do um, in relation to what we're uh, carrying out as a as a final mission. But all in all, yeah, we're we're equipping these with quite a bit of uh, diverse uh, sensor suite um, to uh, to feed into our algorithms and to our uh, to our AI to help make really good decisions. Um, it's it's going to be a pretty powerful uh, little system that we have on board, um, and you know. Lara is basically the stepping stone to get to those uh, more fully capable spacecraft like uh, like the threads. Nice. It looks like a all view cube set. So, yes, I think yeah. we've moved it up to a sixteen. Um, I want to say that's primarily because of. Um, Kind of making it a little easier on ourselves um there was just some decisions that was made to move it to a 16 uh for a mission but ultimately yes it will be in a 12. it initially started off as 12 it was designed in 12. everything was good in 12 but we moved it to a 16 for this one particular launch uh due to some other requirements that came up nice the um I think it's a unique application there with Laura and measuring potential deterioration of materials. Yes. Um, it's a need that uh, the market has right now. Um, there's a lot of questions as to why something uh, died, why something uh, or how something was damaged or uh, what um you know, even if something is still in operation, maybe the communications are just uh, down or hampered for some reason. So all of that, uh, we should uh, be able to help get more insight on and more clarity on with those spacecraft. I think it's pretty, um, it's pretty cool you guys can use this, this laser scanner to characterize the rotational behavior mm -hmm. yes there's a there's a i mean whenever you have biopic uh site you can do a lot of uh, depth analysis you can do a lot of uh, determination with that but again we're we're using multiple sensors to try to uh detail and understand uh the the disposition of a of a uh of another object in space so that we can um, safely approach and, and come in contact with it at the right moment. It, it could propose some interesting ground demos there that measure the tumbling. Yes, exactly. So we'll be doing a lot of coordination between the ground as well as uh, in space observations and you know trying to line those up. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty exciting stuff. Anytime you can go and look at other objects in space, it starts getting really interesting. Do you think you guys will be primarily focused on low Earth orbit? For the moment, uh, in the very, very near term, yes, LEO. However, we are already slated for uh, geostationary in the coming months. Um, or excuse me, uh, I want to say in 24, we've got a ride to geostationary. So that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. That'll, that'll be really really interesting stuff. A lot of great material science to do out there. Seems like a lot of the these Laura bots might be uh, might be helping advance the ecosystem. What is the kind of like the range? Well, how we'll close. Say about the Delta V, so right now it's probably uh, between 500, 550 meters per second worth of Delta V. So it's it's for very close proximity stuff. Okay. It's, it seems far away here on the surface, but imagine cl much closer. My gravity. And and the 
So, so you guys have two other Orbots, the the Barry Orbot and the other Orbot um, as well. I'm sorry, say again? The, so the other Orbot, Barry, seems much smaller, um, dedicated to... Um, With, with similar applications, but um, like helping assess the survivability of, of the on-orbit systems. Yes, that's a, that, so with the material science that we're doing, it's certainly going to contribute to that. Uh, it's certainly going to help with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of what we're going to be able to do is conduct a lot of science that would ultimately help contribute to, you know, extending the, the long-term viability of spacecraft. Um, it's always good to try and you know, contribute and help out where we can. And this is uh, one way we're going to be able to do so uh, with our coordination work with, uh, with Air Force Research Lab. Nice. Hey, the barrier robot, it seems like it's like, um, Tenth of the mass, around a one point five kilograms of three hundred degree imaging and and a longer uh, radar, five kilometer mm -hmm. distance. Well, not necessarily. It the the radar you wouldn't be able to get a good radar in there uh, for on a Barry. Barry's very very small. I'm not sure what what exactly you're looking at, but we'll have to I'll have to go take a look at that. There might be a typo there, um, <clears throat> but. You know, Barry's really an experimental thing to help us get some um, some heritage on our compute and some of our sensors. Uh, it's really not designed for like a, a big time application uh, or anything. You know, it's a very small, very small spacecraft. Not uh, it's not going to be doing too terribly much. Yeah. I was uh really excited to see the the vibrometer. Yep, that's a that's an interesting sensor. Um, we will uh, we're working toward uh, that capability. We've done some preliminary tests. Uh, things are looking okay there. Um, more interesting, though, is some of the propulsion. We just we just got an NSF uh, grant awarded to us to advance our uh, our propulsion system, and uh, hopefully, in the next several months, we may have a little bit more news to the development of the uh, the vibrometer. Congrats! Thank you very much. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. Okay, we started taking a deeper dive into the uh, vibrometers, the uh, non-contact measurements, and um, it's, and so you don't have to like, you don't have that mass loading in exchange. What do you mean? So you can, All right, I'm not clear on that one. Because um, with like a physical sensor, there would be some applied force. Um, if 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 you were to dock to help characterize the system, so you can remotely monitor. Yes, that's right. So it definitely helps offset some of the mass requirements, but it also gives us the ability to be a little more accurate on some things and make it a lot safer because we don't actually have to touch that other object. We're wondering what, what kind of vibrations are, are you looking for uh, in, in measurements? Well, um, it really depends on the, the object that we're looking to try and characterize. Um, uh, it could be... Um, whether or not a thruster is actually firing. Um, you couldn't always visually inspect that, but maybe you could pick up the vibration of a, of a, of a thruster firing, or maybe um, 
something like uh, uh, some sort of a movement of something. It's very similar to putting your ear up against the wall in the house and listening for different things like that. Nice. It was, um, looks like the, the Bragg cell or, or um, acoustic modulator could help monitor the frequency shifts. Yeah, now you see you're starting to get into a little bit more of uh, engineering, and those would be Michael Pika questions. Uh, that's not going to be a Jeremy question because Jeremy's, uh, Jeremy's not an engineer. <laughs> I think I think a lot of us are our engineers um, included. Um, well, it's always better to have the bigger brains on the team. Uh, I, I'm mm. definitely not that guy. It, um, particularly the, the continuous scan laser Doppler fibrometers look really promising. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, and there's all sorts of vibrometers. Yes, and that's where some of the work that we're doing to uh, to do some experiments and understand which one would actually work best uh, for the application, uh, and depending upon what we're um, what we're really listening for. Um, you know, we've got. Um, you know, we've got some pretty good line of sight on some of the funding uh, for us to be able to do that. Now it's uh, now it's a matter of actually uh, putting it into application and and making some uh, you know making some good science and uh, doing a little bit of engineering to tune it in. Heck yeah! Do this um this continuous scan which these researchers found you could um, uh, reduce the measurement time by a hundredfold um, with it compared to regular laser Doppler vibrometers. That sounds interesting. I'll have to take a note and send that over to the guys. Okay. If they don't know about it already, you know, but those uh, were... We're working, uh, we're working on that. So yeah, any suggestions is always appreciated. Okay, so we'll send that over. And really, based on the speckle noise, I was reading it's um the correlation between microscale irregularities and the laser light refracted, um, which would be the primary advantage. It looks like. Okay. Yeah, always happy to take some notes and send it over to the guys. It gets really interesting, too, when you start thinking about the enabled applications and how much of the, um, you know, surface interactions you could quantify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Um... Again, it's all about what we're trying to characterize. Um, it's um, and it depends on what the target is, uh, what the what we're trying to talk, you know, who we're trying to talk to, what it's all about, uh, or excuse me, uh, what analysis we're trying to uh, do on that object. So, um, yeah, it's it's really going to it's all driven by requirements. And so they engineer to those requirements. Um, yeah, I'm currently studying material science here at UVA and um, definitely, you know, looking more into this with the research in terms of quantifying the effects of radiation and thermal stress and atomic oxygen. Okay. Uh, there's some interesting modeling and math to be done there too um these like a lot of the you know the surface systems have a high thermal stress with in, in low earth orbit right um 
But in terms of like the rate, the factors, if it's like a combination of the factors that are limiting lifespan, you guys will find out. <laughs> yeah, there's, so Air Force Research Lab is, um, is, um, uh, is sponsoring some of this material science research. And that's one of the reasons why they're giving us these these free rides to space. Um, the information, the data that we get back from all the various scans and uh, sensors that we uh, use to observe those materials and, and uh, other objects, that's all going to be used to help inform that type of modeling, um, or at least I believe that it would. Um, but you know, hey, that that's for the scientists and engineers to figure out. You know, so um, yes. how best to use that data. Uh, so uh, we're making it available to them, and um, yeah, it should um, it should really help over the long term. At least we hope it will, and of course, it'll help inform us. Nice. Sounds like a fun pixelated puzzle and. Uh, materials puzzle um we you know the more we think about it there there could be a value proposition for these kind of um coding services on, on orbit too okay what do, what do you mean for atomic oxygen and and thermal um thermal oh, you heat. mean like coding like coding yeah. another object in space to make it more resilient. Oh, okay. You know, there was a uh, company um, last year, they hold the patent to a, um, a method. I want to say it's a method of applying a coding to optics in space. So recoding optics in space. Um, which I found to be pretty fast. Um, that was one of the things that they were asking if we would be able to do if, um, you know, with their tech, you know, like change out into factors on a spacecraft to be able to do that. And obviously, 100% we're able to do that. Um, how you would coat another object in space? Um, frankly, I'm really not sure. Again. <laughs> That'd be a fun problem for the engineers to figure out, and I'm sure they'd they'd love to try and work on that. Definitely seems higher risk with the close contact too. But it is, it is, and uh, you'd have to have some pretty resilient safety systems. Uh, but you know that's that's really where we're uh, uh, we're focused is making sure that our our tech is operating in a very very safe manner because. You don't want to create a international incident over, uh, you know, jiggling a solar panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I kind of wonder about um how your orbots could be doing some kind of bear hug on these. Please. Yeah, we're not going to be doing any bear hugs. That that probably is not the best idea. Um. There's a lot. There's a lot safer uh, methods of uh, of getting a hold of a system than uh, than doing a bear hug. That that, that could just introduce all kinds of problems. Yeah. But it seems like this this um, effector um, attachments and and interface holds holds a lot of promise too. I'm sorry, saying in. It seems like this um, vector enabled um, system holds a lot of like, downstream value too in, in applications. That's right, because a lot of spacecraft are designed to go up, do one very specific thing, and then it's over with. Well, what we're doing is we're designing our spacecraft to so that it can be very um, uh, very agnostic 
So instead of sending up a whole new spacecraft, you may we may end up just three D printing a um, uh, a new end effector, if you will, or uh, sending up a new end effector instead of a whole new spacecraft. If we don't already have the end effector that's needed, we just send up the, a new uh, end effector. Um. I was also curious on the kind of the glimpse into the future and what um, kind of future applications you guys might be planning or look forward to. Um, sure. So I would say that our future is very much focused in infrastructure, um, everything from on orbit servicing um, and uh, having refueling points and stations very similar to that of like Orbit Fab. Uh, we work with Orbit Fab, um, uh, doing refueling missions and uh, uh, repair missions and uh, parts storage and parts transport or moving things from one orbit to the next. Uh, I mean, there's all kind of communications. I mean, we're an infrastructure company. We're a satellite servicing and infrastructure company. So therefore we, um, you know, the, the future is pretty wide open uh, for us to be able to do uh, any number of things and pursue any number of uh, avenues for revenue. Um, it, it's, that's kind of the nice thing about space and the nascent stage that it's in. We have the ability to go into any number of directions, but right now we're, we're solely focused on that satellite servicing and, and support function. And um, over the years, uh, it's going to grow from there. Nice. I start to wonder everything like red wire and made in space, and if you could eventually, you know, you know, you have the materials up there, and you could, you know, in situ manufacture some some ore bots or or miniature scales. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we 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 have. Plenty of conversations with Redwire um, and uh, Maiden Space. Uh, we know those guys. Um, we've got a lot of opportunity to work and partner with uh, any number of companies that are in the space ecosystem. Um, this is uh, this is something that we work on every single day, and we're always looking to. Uh, to try and advance those partnerships wherever we can um, up to and include, you know, moving stuff around and bringing stuff back. It's, the future is bright, especially whenever you involve partnerships. Yeah. It, imagine like, you know, there's a, um, there, is it like a, some near catastrophe or or something with the James Webb telescope or the space station a few years down the road or you know and I, you guys could definitely help characterize those interactions and materials to some extent yeah yeah the ISS is doing a lot of work um, the, you can actually send material up there and they will um, put it into the space environment for you it's it's really interesting they've got plenty of opportunity to do that but yeah we we have an opportunity to do a lot of study and a lot of and help a great deal with material science and you know helping that community just helps and reinforces ourselves so um we're always looking to partner up with um with anyone that can help advance the causes of uh of this economy well, it's, it's very exciting. It's, we're wishing you guys the best of luck there with Rogue. So, well, so. I appreciate that, Cole. Um, I really appreciate you having me, and um, you know, please send me that info. Uh, always looking to get new ideas, and um, you know, 
thank you. Thank you again for having me. Always happy to have a conversation. Good time. I look forward to supporting your research and, and efforts over there. So thanks, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much.